welcome Ellen and Papani. Hi. 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 How are you today? Here. Doing well. Great. Thank you for asking. Excellent. Doing I'm going to dive right in. So this first question, actually, let's just start with you, Ellen, uh, with onboarding. So uh, I hear you're remotely onboarding. Can you tell us about that experience? Yeah, so I joined Calm back in July, uh, remote, um, uh, onboarded remotely. Um, it certainly was an experience like no other. Uh, I remember was, my first week was pretty daunting. Uh, my first day, we had a welcome session where everybody says hi for five minutes, high energy. And then the next moment when the meeting ended, I was alone in my room um, by myself. Uh, and I was thinking, uh-oh, uh, what, what's, what's coming next? Um, well, fortunately, like my team and my boss actually put together a very explicit onboarding plan, lay out what to do on day one, what to do on week one, and in the first 30 days, that gave me a roadmap to um, continue to onboard. Makes sense. I don't know, Pavani, if you've had an ex experience or similar experience or any reflections. Um, no, I, I've been lucky in, in the sense that um, I haven't really had to do onboarding remotely, but I do have a lot of teams that are international. And so I've had times where I've had to work with external teams and it can be a bit daunting because you don't really know anybody there. But true collaboration always helps in that scenario. So I think what LM1 is something uh, indicated is something that everybody goes through. But once you have good teammates, a good buddy system, which we'll talk about, I think that helps a lot with the onboarding onboarding process. hundred percent. So folks, as you're listening, you know, feel free to ask any questions that you have for either Papani or Ellen as it relates to remote onboarding, hiring, etc. There's a lot that I know we can learn from both of them and this is your opportunity. So go to the Q&A tab on the side of your screen, put in those questions. If you have no questions but you want to see what other folks ask, go ahead, put them in, upvote them. I will start with, you know, couple more that I have, but I'd love to go to you. So feel free, put in your questions as soon as you have them. So uh, Pavani, I, I have this question for you here. Um, how has the role of the engineering manager changed to support new hires? And how do you help new hires get quick wins and visibility about the roadmap? I think when it comes to engineering managers, especially their role has become extremely important because one of the key things we, we have taken for granted when we were pre-pandemic was the ability for people to go to people's desk and just ask them, hey, how do we fix this? Or how do you get along? How do you sort this out? Now the engineer manager is going to have to be very much involved to establish a relationship with um, these new hires to make sure that, hey, do they have everything that they need? And do they have the right support from the various teammates, right? We tend to, especially in engineering, we tend to get into you know, environments where we are very much secluded and trying to sort things out and figure things out because we want to you know have a, a direct impact but what i think we have to do is ensure that the engineer manager and focuses on making sure that these new hires have a good buddy system right somebody that they, they can easily report to easily go to now that we're talking through slack there's no emotion through slack right when you're writing messages you you lack that interactive nature and so it's going to be very important that the engineering manager is always available for any sort of questions. And we should always remember there are no stupid questions because everybody wants to get and understand things quickly. I don't know, Ellen, what do you think? Yeah, I can add to that as well. Um, because I personally onboarded remotely, I have just so much empathy for that daunting feeling of just, you know, you want to come in and hit the ground running, but do you even know where the ground is, right? You, you need some kind of framework. And so personally, I had a really good onboarding plan. And with new hires that has joined since, we have very explicit onboarding plan for day one, first week, and first 30, 60, 90 days. Um, and it goes beyond like just a uh, deliverable. It actually says, who are the people you should meet and get familiar with? These are the Slack channels that you want to join and get familiar with conversations over there. Um, and on quick wins, that's actually really important, depending on the role and the person, like identifying something that they can accomplish in the first week or two, right? This is a way for you to give them feedback and say, hey, this is what we are, you know, establishing you um, as an IC or as a leader on the team. This is what look it looks like to have that quick win. And here's the feedback on that, right? And I think 
what we used to take for granted in person is you get the smiles and the high fives and and you know just just the encouragement. Now with the remote world, that has to be explicit. Um, I can't like count how many times the new hires actually like the face lit up. And when doing one on one, I just casually said, "Oh, so and so said you did a really great job reviewing that PR. It was very thorough." That they just it just brightens them up, and and that matters a lot now when we're all remote. Absolutely, and in in addition to that, I think that the onboarding process is going to be very key with quick wins. And I think when you hire new people, we 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 take advantage of the fact that when somebody gets hired, there's all this, they are very excited, but we also have to make sure that they're also brought along on the journey, right? There's a journey. Every business has a journey and that, and that journey needs to be understood. And so, which is why, and I was talking to our onboarding manager, CJ at, at Venmo, he said for him, the first two weeks of onboarding is the most critical aspect of a new hire's uh, uh, tenure. Because at that point, that is what they understand what the business is there and how they're going to support the customer. Once they are on that same page on that journey, then the quick wins come naturally because they know and understand how their business units is going to affect the business to collaborate and give things to the customer. I love that you both talk about, you know, quick wins and kind of building confidence for, for new folks because I know as a hiring manager, it can be very easy to go, oh, I've been waiting so long to get that hire on my team so that I can get X, Y, Z done. And you just want to give them the work. And in some cases, you know, the, you know, really important work, but if that work is like this 12 week scoped massive thing, and you're not going to get any win for a very long time, that can uh, probably affect the morale of that new person joining. Uh, right? Absolutely. I think um, we have to think, you know, we've, it's just like a development cycles, right? We have the agile development, you have the waterfall development cycle. Depending on the environment you're in, I personally do not like waterfall because it takes a long time for you to see what you've actually built. When you have an agile methodology where you're basically like, hey, let's see what we do within the next two sprints, right? Let's figure this out. Then you realize, like uh, Ellen said, you will see smiles on people's faces because they're building stuff that customers are actually using right there and then. 100%. And, you know, we, we're very privileged in the software side of things and our ability to be able to choose and to, you know, most of us these days do use Agile. I recall, you know, folks that are in kind of the hardware world where, you know, sometimes the decision points, like you can't, you can't iterate, you know, when it's like a physical thing, you know, it's hard to get out of that. But to your point, like being able to be Agile, flexible to adjust what you're doing is, is really beneficial and can allow you to do cooler things and get cooler quick wins with uh, you know that that early early process I want to actually dive into questions from folks because we already have several so this uh, first question from Greg and feel free for either of you to answer and, and hand off to the other um, how do you assess the cultural fit when onboarding somebody remotely obviously you know they, they're not being exposed directly to the culture so how do you make that work hmm. Ellen you want to go first? Um, so I think that this actually starts before the, the new hire start, right? Like as part of the interview process, we definitely want to look for someone that is a cultural fit, right? Calm is, you know, 150 people, Eng team is roughly under 50 people. You know, having someone who is part of our culture, uh, our culture um, is humble and hungry. Uh, we care about growth mindset and high EQ. And during the interview process, we actually ask the questions um, to discern that signal, whether or not the person is in fact a cultural fit. So that's step one is in a hiring process, in fact. Um, step two um, is actually making them feel welcome, right? Like our onboarding process, build a sense of community, right? We have like, wave of people starting together. Um, this also make your IT team a little bit, uh, have an easier time as well, sending them laptops all at the same time. Um, but they are onboarding together. They have like new hires as part of the cohort, uh, onboarding together and immersing in that culture. Um, and at the same time, per new hire, we have a dedicated Slack channel. Um, one, uh, two of our new hires is called Juan and Utako. We actually have them start together, one Slack channel. It's a safe space for them to ask all the questions, right? They can post what their quick win first task is in there and have everyone come in and help them. So that really help provide a venue for them to start getting to know one another, start immersing uh, into the company culture. I'm reminded how, you know, when we think about culture, it's an interesting topic, right? Because particularly when everyone's remote, it's like, you know, how do you absorb the culture? And that's where, whether that be Slack or documents or just, you know, your 
intro experience, maybe your that first interview actually, right? That's a, a time to experience culture, right? At the same time, you know, in the back of my mind, I reflect on how culture can sometimes be, for lack of better words, like a scapegoat for bias, you know, where we say our culture is like, you know, like, oh, someone's not a cultural fit. Well, maybe it's just because like you are, you know, you need to broaden your mind about having more perspectives on your team. I don't know. Right. right. No, that makes sense. Yeah. So I actually do have uh, some experience around that as well. Since I joined, we've actually been hiring a lot and it's all through remote. Right. Um, and sometimes, you know, we, we all know that we like we tend to like people that are like ourselves. And we do see that in debrief as well. It's like, oh, this person, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not quite sure. But that's where it's extra important to fall back into like having explicit rubrics. Right. Like, for example, we care about communication. We care about growth mindset. We care about like being mission driven. And can you like, you know, give a score per rubric and be explicit about why you're not sure about someone. Right. We're not trying to hire people to come in and hang out and be friends. I mean, it's great when we do, but it's really more important to lean on the rubrics to avoid bias. Um, I don't know, Papani, uh, any if you have experience around that as well. Yeah, I think you, you've you just said it beautifully. I think at the end of the day, a couple of things. One, understand what the mission of the business is. Two, uh, being welcoming. And three, using that rubric. I think one of the things that we have started doing is actually thinking about a barrier's uh, capability within the hiring process. So, you know, this is a, somebody who is third party, who is not part of the hiring team, but is outside of the group to actually assess and understand whether this person is actually a fit or not. I think cultural fit is something, like you said, is something that's a scapegoat, but we have to think about, is this person going to help the business go on a direction that is going to help the customer? Again, I always think about the customer number one, right? One of my old mentors gave me a framework. It's called a CBTI framework. First thing you think about the customer, which is the C, B is the business, T is the team, and I is the individual. You think of that process. So if you think in that manner, you will always make sure you you always make the right decision because you're thinking about the customer first before you think about either individual or I don't know how I feel about this person, so on and so forth. So I love that as a perspective and a framework. We, we've talked earlier today with other folks about kind of losing sight of the forest through the trees. So that's a CBT. I hadn't heard that before, but I like that as a, as a way to go through it. This next question from Lucas is, what questions have you added to your interview process in response to the pandemic, you know, and going remote? I imagine some folks, they're doing this for the first time and they're, they just have their existing, you know, set of questions. And it's like, how do they modify that, you know, for remote? Um, well, I can, I can take the, the first answer. So, um, well, I joined Calm Remote, and so these are actually all new questions. Um, and actually, one of my favorite questions to ask my candidates is, what questions do you have for me? Um, you know, as someone who is evaluating a new opportunity, especially remote, especially you're going to you know, go through a hurdle of onboarding remotely, it's a big decision. And we definitely want them to have all of the answers that they need to make a decision. So um, a lot of times, actually, the question speaks a lot about what they care about and uh, tell us more about cultural fit. Um, and that has been serving us very well. Bupani, do you have any thoughts on like a particular question or two during the interview process that you find is really helpful when hiring remotely? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I have particular questions, but I have a theme. I, it's more around you know understanding that empathy has to be taken into consideration because well, we are working from home. A lot of people have families at home and kids running around. And so, you know, I, I try to make them feel calm and understand that, hey, we understand where we are today. And I know that we may have a 9 a.m. meeting and your kid is going to be on the back of your head pulling your hair. It's perfectly OK. Um, I think that we have tried to make it more accepting in a way that we are very flexible and we have to be flexible in this environment. And I think that has helped quite a bit when you talk to various candidates because they realize that, oh, it isn't a nine to five thing. I don't have to be in front of my computer every single day while I am trying to tutor my kids or I'm trying to, you know, feed them up. Right. So I think them understanding that they, 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 they relax a little bit and they don't have to always be on, I think. And, and that's something that has happened initially when we first started the pandemic. Everybody tried to be always on. And I think people started to burn out 
because of that. But when you make them realize that as an environment, we are very empathetic and understand what has to be done. As long as you get work that we've all agreed that you have to get done, I think people are more accepting. Uh, I'm reminded of um, you know Google doing their study a few years back of the most successful teams there and that the number one indicator of team success was psychological safety. And I totally feel you know that when you have that empathy as you described, right, that creates that environment of safety where you feel like you can take risks and you can make mistakes and yes. you, know, you can fail loudly and it'll be okay. And I think part of the thing, and I try to tell people this every time they're asking, oh, I'm going to an interview, what kind of questions you should ask? And I said, look, the interview process is a two-way street. It's not just about the company interviewing you. It's also you interviewing a company because you're going to spend a significant amount of your time in that environment, right? And so you have to make sure that is also a perfect fit for you. So also come up with your questions to see whether, hey, is this the right place to be? So totally, you both kind of touched on this idea of like asking what questions do you have for me? I definitely, it resonates for me as a hiring manager that um, when I hear somebody say they don't have questions or they just don't ask or they aren't inquisitive, it it's, it's I don't know if you'd say it's a lack of authenticity, but it, it like feels like they don't care. <laughs> and that when they when they share and they inquire and they show like that sense of care, you feel like, oh, this person cares, they're interested. Because you want to work with people that, you know, feel like you feel like they care. That uh, makes sense, David. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that makes sense. But also you have to realize that sometimes it depends on the seniority of the engineers. Hmm. People who are younger tend not to have questions because they really want to work at your company. <laughs> they, want, they don't want to make any mistake or say anything versus more senior people like us. We, we tend to have gone through this rodeo, so we will ask as much more. So that's a, it's a good reminder. It's also a good reminder from a cultural perspective that, you know, in some some cultures, it, it's not as welcome to kind of question authority, if you will. And there may be a lot more concern or resistance there. So it's a good reminder that, you know, we need to be prepared for that. Uh, this next question from Inna, how do you create an environment for social interactions for new hires to bond with the rest of the team and feel included throughout their first few weeks and months? Yeah, I can speak to that a bit. Um, so uh, personally, remote, uh, re uh, onboarded remotely, definitely. Uh, I appreciate all of the you know non-work focused channels at work, right? We have like a fun, uh, fun pets at Calm, fun kids at Calm. Uh, we have a channel called Warm and Fuzzies, and these are all things that just we share cute pictures of our pets and and kids, and it's just a way to share a piece of our personal life. We're beyond just the person that you know write a proposal or check in code. Um, there's actually a whole piece of personal life that a lot of times you can see in the background of, of a Zoom call. Um, so really, like having people have a venue to share that aspect uh, was definitely very helpful. Uh, within my team, there are definitely a few people that uh, join remotely. Um, so we try to do like game night. Uh, we have a social channel where every now and then we just like set a Zoom call where people pop in and just talk about anything but work. Uh, and, and that part definitely helped build that bond and trust um, and just lead to better and happier uh, working together. I love that. I, it, you know, it, it's, it's not the first time that we've heard today that, you know, you kind of, particularly when folks are remote, you need to manually create things that, you know, typically are organic and natural when they're in person, but like, it's like, if you don't do it, it won't appear. If you don't create a channel for whatever your, your pets or your, or your kids or your, you know, video games or whatever, like it won't appear. Like you have to like carve that out. I don't know, Papani, if you, you've experienced kind of the, any kind of carving out of like that kind of social side of things, like while Absolutely. Home. Absolutely. Um, I'm an avid gamer. Mm -hmm. I'm an <laughs> I, I, you know, it's like, I try and get people and ask questions about Xbox, this and that. I mean, to be very honest, I try, I, I do do the, the social events on Zoom, but Zoom fatigue is a real thing. So at some points I'm like, I'm just done with this Zoom. But I want to play Xbox. I want to play PlayStation. I want to do something. So, you know, I try to get some folks on um, some of the games that we play. Uh, we play FIFA 21. If anybody's interested, you can find us on, on the Xbox. We'll, we'll look you uh, up. <laughs> uh, but uh, also sometimes I just give people phone calls. I just call people like, yo, what's up? Right. 
we've been on Zoom all day. I just want to give you a phone call. How are you doing? How are things going? Now, it depends on the individual, how comfortable they are sharing their phone number and so on and so forth. But sometimes that works too, because sometimes at the end of the day, once you know that they matter and, they, and that people care about them. And so, again, going back to empathy, this is one of the biggest things that we've learned during the pandemic, how important it is. So being connected in other aspects other than, you know, a video call or, you know, you know, a, a meeting and all that kind of stuff. So um, playing video games helps me with my group and friends and stuff like that. So it works out. I love that. I, you know, the <laughs> everyone has like, whether it be your video games or your whatever, the, the idea that we need to over index the empathy during the pandemic because people are under indexed with respect to their resources and the stability of the environment around them. I mean, even earlier today, you know, dog like running in the background, like chaos happens. We're here. We're trying to make it work. So, yeah. you know, um, I want to share actually a personal experience, um, you know, yeah. recently. So I remember in my first couple weeks at Calm, um, there were definitely some conversations that were the, not the most comfortable, right? Um, within the first month there, there was a reorg. And and actually as a new leader joining, uh, I had to talk with the team. Uh, one of the teams actually got dissolved and get merged into another team that the business wanted to invest further in. And so like, right off the bat, there were just, just some difficult conversations with the team. And I remember at the time I thought, wow, that's that's so hard. Um, I haven't actually bonded with the team yet. We haven't had that connection. We have never met in person. And so like to have those difficult conversations was just a bit daunting. And I asked another leader who I've seen onboarded really well remotely. And her pro tip for me was just just sketch out time to go to all the happy hours, especially if you're new and you're your leader. Go to all the happy hours, have time with them that is not about work because you do need to have that bonding and that trust however you can get in order to work effectively. Um, so taking that advice and also actually going through something like a reorg, having very authentic conversations with the team, um, help us bond and build stronger relationships. And when you have strong relationships, it just makes everything smoother. Difficult conversations or even happy conversations and projects um, just flow so much smoother. Um, so that's, that is uh, my experience uh, so far. I love that. It reminds me of the, the radical candor framework of, you know, challenging directly, but also caring personally, you know, and that if you care personally, you can be a more effective manager. Um, this next question from Ilya is going after talent, wherever it is, how do you trade off time zones, reach cost and time to hire? Like now that sort of, Everyone out there under the sun, regardless of where they are, is is someone to consider. You know, how do you figure all that out? Um, yeah, I, I can I can certainly go again. Go ahead. No, yeah. go ahead, please. So yeah, basically since I joined back in July, I have been hiring, hiring, hiring. So this has been like like I've been living this life for a while. Um, I think first and foremost, like work with your um, HR team, work with your people ops team. One you is you really have to understand is there a limitation to your company in employees that they can hire, right? Um, so for example, at Calm, we can hire anyone within the US, but if you're outside of the US, um, then you have to check with your uh, people ops team to know what are the limitations there. Um, another aspect is the job function. So for engineering, for example, we do have a certain compliance around data where people outside of the US may not have access to. So if the person's lo location limit their ability to do their job, that is something you need to consider and maybe you can't hire them uh, because of that. Uh, a third aspect is we do ask our new hires to work PST time zone, right? So they, they could be in New York, um, they could be in other time zone, but they do have to um, you know, understand their certain core hours where meetings thus happen and they, they need to be able to work those hours. So those are the three key things uh, when thinking about hiring uh, all across uh, in different locations. Yeah, that's very good points. I think for, I would say, you know, PayPal Inc. in particular, it's, it's slightly different because we are an international company. We have teams across the world. And as I think that what happens is that as you start hiring folks, one of the key things is business function to access to data. Uh, but three, also, I think the, the the ability to provide your solutions for the customer, right? So when you, as you build stuff out, you have to work with product managers, you have to TPMs, you have to work with various engineers. You, depending on the team and the function that team does, I think you have to line with those various teams to on junior collaboration. I think 
things change when you are building solutions that are something across the internet international businesses um and i think it it is something you think about in collaboration with other engineering managers because there may be times where you do need somebody to work in a different time zone for a particular reason um but i i, I highly for my opinion is like hire people that are good people who are hungry and people who want to do the best the time zone stuff will work out yes there are logistics in terms of hey when i send an email to somebody who is on you know in asia it may take 24 hours for them to to respond and get that information back to me but i think that if people are truly hungry people are truly dedicated those things iron out as a process because you will figure out what the collaboration model is you don't always have to have the solution when you start it's something that maybe the companies do have to adjust and, and change their, their thought processes in that way so focus on talent focus on on the individual and see how they can help benefit the business I really love hearing both of your responses because you hear actually, you know, the contrast between, you know, when you're at an international company and, you know, they're really it's kind of hard to have core hours, you know, if your core hours would be at like 4 a.m. in the morning or 1 a.m. in the morning. And it, on the other side, you know, there are some business functions where what, you, what data you can access is limited based off of where you're physically located and that can, can influence things. But certainly, of course, everybody wants to hire the, the best talent. I, I am reminded of uh, when we were at uh, my last company, doctor.com, you know, a, a CTO there, most of our engineers were actually based in, in Argentina, but there was a set of data that was sensitive because we're in healthcare tech that like they could not access. So it was impossible for us to have everyone there. And, um, and you know, it's like, I guess it's, it's, this is one of those, your mileage may vary sort of things, right? Where you have to ask the business leaders, what are their needs? You have to ask yourself, what are your team needs? And in some cases you have an international business, you know, be able to do, kind of more as uh, Venmo slash PayPal Inc does. And then, you know, on the, you know, on the calm side where, you know, you have Pacific hours and you come in and you do your hours, like totally different perspective. I know my co-founder who was recently a head of product at Carta before this, you know, at Carta, they have a set start time and a set meeting time every day that is the same for everyone, same time zone. And, you know, that works for some folks. So I guess your mileage may vary. We have a time for maybe one or two more questions. This, this one's from Tumas. What are the main differences in the onboarding challenges when you compare onboarding an engineering manager compared to onboarding an individual contributor? Mm. I, can start with, I, can yeah. start, I can start with this Go one. Go for it. I think the, the role of the engineer manager has evolved over time and it really depends on the company that you're in. But the, the role of the engineer manager, whether it's a director, you know, senior manager, VP, whatever, is to help the business contribute, right? And you're supposed to be that person that is able to not only influence and encourage people to get things done. When you are hiring an engineer manager, I strongly believe you need to find somebody who is a talent multiplier. You need somebody that can not only, you know, understand how to build things and build teams, but also is capable of building components within that team that helps the business grow fundamental. And I see there are various people who can be ICs and may not be a talent multiplier, but they're the people that essentially get shit done, right? You may still have somebody that, hey, I need this component built in the next 48 hours, go into your corner and just get it done. And they will just do it. There are people who just love to write code and don't want to interact with anybody. So it really depends on what you're trying to build, all right? And the team you're trying to build. If you're building a long-term uh, group, where you, you want this team to be in something that is consistently producing, hire an engineer manager who is able to influence, who is able to be a talent multiplier and understands empathy. Because you're gonna get a lot out of that because people will simply just trust that individual and work for that individual. As they say, people don't leave companies, people leave managers. Right? I think we've all heard that before, that right? That when you're onboarding an individual contributor, figure out what that process is. If it's a tech lead, you may want somebody who is also a talent multiplier at that point because you want, you know, nobody can build everything by themselves. But if at, at, at certain times, if you just need somebody to build certain components, mm -hmm. hey, go ahead and build, you know, hire somebody who just writes code. So it really depends on the situation. Uh, that's my humble opinion. I don't know, Ellen. Yeah, uh, I definitely, you know, echo that as well. I think the key difference between an individual contributor and a, a leader or a manager is 
um, the, the outcome that you're look for, the quick wins, the, the outcome is different, right? Like as an IC, your deliverable might be code, it might be like a feature, right? It's very concrete. And so as they build it, as they ship it, it becomes that adrenaline rush, like, okay, I have accomplished. Um, that is actually harder uh, for an entering leader or entering manager. And so like um, that part, um, as a manager of manager, uh, that's where you have to actually give very explicit uh, feedback and positive reinforcement. Um, your positive feedback may not be, oh, great job shipping that feature, right? Because feature could take months to ship, but it's like, oh, uh, great job like driving that meeting today, or great job putting together that proposal, or great job understanding this part of the business. Um, so it's very different way of giving them positive reinforcement in making sure that they're on track. Um, another thing I want to also, um, you know, talk about is I think first line managers is actually, you know, the most stressed out um, amounts like the engineering team. Um, their job is that much harder. They have to drive projects. They want to make sure every ICs on the team is doing well. Um, everything is remote. It's harder to coordinate. And there, a lot of them are doing that you know, in that scenario for the first time. And so like self-care is another aspect that I stress with the first line manager on, on my team, making sure that, hey, I really know that you care about your team, but take care of yourself as well. And so that is also a really important aspect. Totally, taking care of yourself. You can't, can't say more how important that is, so I agree. Both of you, thank you so much for the time, Papani and Ellen. We appreciate your wisdom, your knowledge, and wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much.